And now I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Naomi Rose from the Anif Animal Welfare Institute and uh, those who will be speaking with her. Uh. Hello. <clears throat> um, I have a presentation. Thank you very much for um, inviting all of us to speak with you today on this important issue. And um, I'm here to ask you, uh, on behalf of the Animal Welfare Institute, to vote no on this proposal. And I know that this might seem a strange thing for an animal welfare advocate to propose that we don't give these whales more space. Well, the reason I'm voting, I'm asking you to vote no, is because giving them incrementally more space is um, ill-advised at this time. There's a number of reasons. I've written um, a letter to you um, in the, on this uh, topic about the waste of resources this might prove to be. If you put $100 million into this big hole in the ground at this point, events are starting to move forward on several different levels, including um, in the legislature here in California. And there's a drought going on, and, and public opinion is changing. And quite frankly, it might be best, at the very least, to reconsider the timing of this, to at least wait you know, until certain events play out and we see where things stand in two or three years. Building this enclosure now and SeaWorld investing this kind of money and the city of San Diego and the state investing this kind of money into um, this enclosure just seems bad timing to me. Um, and I think it will be in the end, uh, events will overtake this decision here today and uh, it will be a waste of resources if you vote yes on this. Um, I think I have the ability to move my own. Yes. So there are 58 orcas on display in eight countries um, in the world. Uh, most of them are here in the United States, but there are some um, all, over the, all over the world. There's some in Asia, there's some in um, Russia, there's some in, in Europe. So in Russia, there's a capture operation going on right now. They've taken, I found it very interesting that SeaWorld said that they don't know anything about those captures in Russia. I know a lot about those captures in Russia. It's not actually really hard as an advocate for conservation to know about those captures in Russia. They should know more about those captures in Russia. They are providing orcas for the public display industry, which they are a member of. I'm rather surprised to hear that, that they don't know very much about it. There have been 15 captures in the last, um, since 2012, so that's the last three years. Um, two were just this year. And 10 of those were before um, the date on the condition for this permit. So um, even though I've heard today that they are pledging additionally not to take those animals or their offspring or genetic material from those animals, it isn't clear to me that they are talking about the 10 before February 12, 2014, or just the five after February 12, 2014. So I do think that those Russian orcas are relevant to the discussion here. When it comes to their welfare, I'm going to just run really quickly through some free-ranging versus captive animal differences. This is something I've spent a lot of time discussing um, in my job. I, I have been addressing the issue of um, the public display and the welfare of captive marine mammals, including orcas, since uh, 1993. So for 22 years I've been working on this issue. Um, I am an orca biologist. I studied them in the Pacific Northwest. I'm most familiar with the northern residents, um, which, are, which are threatened under Canadian law, but I'm also familiar with the southern residents, which are endangered under U.S. law. So in terms of space, you've seen this slide already, so I won't spend too much time on it. As Dr. Visser pointed out, this is one short period of a day, what one orca did, he, do he dove to 600 feet and he moved a great deal of horizontal distance and that little blue um, uh, box in the upper corner is what the whales at SeaWorld have to move around in. And so no matter what they do in terms of building larger concrete enclosures, they cannot give the animals what they need. This is a species that is very high on the list of species that don't belong in captivity. There are some species that are too large, too socially complex, too intelligent to thrive in captivity, and orcas top that list. Elephants are also on that list. Uh, polar bears are on that list because they're so wide-ranging. They simply do not thrive in captivity. We're not talking about all zoos and aquariums. I've heard that also today, that we're somehow or other radically trying to close down all zoos and aquariums. That's not the case. We're talking about a specific species that does not thrive in captivity, and I think this slide is really indicative of why. There are a lot of researchers who work with orcas in the wild 
who are opposed to their public display, who support um, the legislation by Assemblyman Bloom, for example. They wrote a letter supporting it because of this very simple m math. Large animal, small concrete enclosure. Social groupings. Their family bonds are broken. No matter what you have heard about the separation of mothers and calves, they do separate mothers and calves. Depends on how you define a calf. If you're just talking about a dependent uh, calf that's still nursing, sure, they don't break those bonds unless there's some medical need. But once they stop nursing, SeaWorld is free to move these animals around on, under their own policy. Well, the fact is, is that in nature, even with the, the populations that do have some dispersal, a young orca will not leave its mother's side until it's five to 10 years old, all right? So there are some populations that show some dispersal, but not until they're five to 10 years old. That is the earliest you should be separating any calf from its mother. But in fact, the populations which form the basis, the foundation of the SeaWorld uh, collection, as they call it, um, are in fact North Atlantic's and North Pacific whales. And those whales show long-term family bonds that last for life. So to take a calf that is 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old, and move it to a different park is breaking a family bond. Environmental quality and complexity. Well, that's the tank at SeaWorld that's going to be um, the equivalent of the tank at SeaWorld that's going to be demolished. This is um, G Pool in Orlando. Um, it used to have rock features. It used to have landscaping. Uh, they took all of that out when uh, the trainer, was, uh, Don Brancho, was killed in, in uh, February of 2010. They removed those rock features. I actually was foolish enough to believe that those were permanent rock features, but they, in fact, were just an overlay that they very easily just lifted out and removed. That was so that they could put in the fast-rising floor, which is um, so far, luckily, not been tested. But, in fact, they removed all of the features from this enclosure to put in that fast-rising floor. If you look at these architectural designs, um, which are part of the application, you will notice that most of the features, most of the landscaping is on land. It's for the people. There's not very much marine scaping going on there. This is still just going to be a concrete tank with a lot of glass. It's going to be for the viewing public, not really for the whales. Just one of the examples of, of why this is so different for them. If you notice in those uh, artist, artist renderings that SeaWorld showed, the visibility in those tanks is wonderful. You can see all the way to the back and all the way to the bottom. It's utterly clear to maximize the visitor's experience. That's not natural. Ocean, the ocean is turbid. It's got a lot of um, other features in it that cause um, visibility to be low. And then, of course, there's just depth where the light drops out. If any of you are divers, you know how fast the light drops out. 30 feet, 40 feet, you're getting into darkness. These animals routinely drive, dive, as you saw in the uh, slide I showed, to 600 feet. They're in pitch black darkness, and they use their echolocation to navigate. This tank is a completely unnatural environment for them, and it's the biggest one they're ever going to build for these animals. One of the reasons we were hoping to uh, encourage the promotion of sea, of sea pen, not sea cage, I thought that was pretty funny actually, um, sea pen um, sanctuaries is because it will allow them to live in a more natural environment. It still won't be perfect. It won't be as deep as they should be diving. It won't be as um, big as they should be, you know, in terms of horizontal distance that they should be swimming but it'll be bigger than this. And this is as big as they can financially, feasibly make it, all right? But it'll be, if we uh, are able to work together to um, create sea pen sanctuaries, it will be larger than this. And we are going to have a workshop at the Society for Marine Mammalogy um, in December this year. I invite all of you to attend, it's open to the public, on sea pen sanctuaries. And we will have speakers from a wide variety of disciplines to talk about the logistics, the actual nuts and bolts of what it would mean to have a sea pen sanctuary in operation, whether it's the state of California or Oregon or Washington or Maine for that matter. We don't know where it will be. It will be carefully located so it won't have all of the problems that Dr. Nolan's talked about. I hope he's been talking to the US Navy about these problems because there's a sea cage facility right next to um, SeaWorld, which they don't seem to have a problem with, but um, then I'm not sure why they have a problem with the concept that we're proposing. And finally, behavioral restrictions. These are predators, the ocean's top predators. So you've got 
this, this is what they should be doing. And I've got a picture in a moment of them herding fish, so don't, don't think I'm trying to say they're all marine mammal hunters. Some of them are fish eaters. But this is what they should be doing, and this is what they do in captivity. Again, what about those teeth, okay, the wearing down of the teeth? It's not from what they eat, okay? It's not how they eat, because they ne their teeth never touch their food, all right? They have fish dropped right down into their gullets. Yes, occasionally they'll pick up a fish that has fallen, you know, uh, into the water, but basically they are not touching the fish with their teeth. This is not how they wear their teeth in a natural sort of way, either through their feeding methods. They wear their teeth from other neurotic behaviors. And one of the reasons um, I have trouble with SeaWorld isn't because of any cruelty. I don't think they're being cruel to these whales. I think they love these whales. I think they really do, especially the trainers. There's no doubt about it that they feel an extremely strong bond with these animals, but they don't understand them. They think they do. They think they're the world's experts, but they've never spent any time observing these animals in the wild. And if they don't know what normal is, then they cannot know what abnormal is. They cannot recognize abnormal if they don't know what normal is. All right? And you actually, if you talk to some of them, you'll find out they've never even seen a wild whale. Those are the people who are responsible for their welfare, people who've never seen a wild whale. That disturbs me. All right? And so they can't know that you know, the chewing on the walls and the gates is actually completely abnormal. That is not what they do in the wild. They don't chew on logs or rocks in their environment. They don't do that, all right? Now, this is fish herding in Norway, a very cooperative behavior. They um, make a big herring ball, and then they cooperatively take turns moving through it and feeding on these animals, uh, feeding on these fish. Um, it's a family affair when they do it. And that's what happens in captivity, right down the gullet. How do they wear their teeth? Not through handling their prey. I would love SeaWorld to do a scientific study on why their whales wear their teeth. There's almost no literature on this, and it's certainly not coming from SeaWorld. SeaWorld has published 50 orca papers in the last 50 years, which is a very low output, incidentally. A 50-year scientific career should produce 200, 300, 400 papers, not 50. But nevertheless, not one of them is about dentition. Not one of them is about why their whales break and wear their teeth. Instead of explaining what's going on in captivity, they tell you it's normal. And so they don't have to study it. But it's not normal. That's normal. That's a stranded resident whale in the Pacific Northwest. So it's dead. That's why it looks so terrible. It is dead. But look at its teeth. Absolutely gorgeous. That's a resident whale eating salmon in the Pacific Northwest. Those are captive whales. Now, there are wild populations of killer whales with worn teeth. Dr. Visser mentioned them. Dr. Nolens mentioned them. There are such populations. But their teeth wear at the population level. All the whales in that particular population have worn teeth. It's because of the way they feed. And we're still trying to figure all of that out. Is it because they are the type of um, prey they handle? Is it because of the way they're handling the prey? We actually don't know. But it's at the population level. Most populations have those beautiful, gorgeous teeth. So if in some populations they have tooth wear, it's because of the way they're handling their prey or because of their prey. Maybe they're very abrasive. We don't know yet. Why are they like that in captivity? Why are they broken? Why are they worn down to the gums? It's probable that in the wild populations, it's a health problem. It's probably causing um, problems for those populations that suffer from that tooth wear because of the way they handle their prey. So if, when SeaWorld tells you there are no health problems to this condition, that's simply not logical. Bad teeth affect human beings. Of course bad teeth are a problem for their health. Why isn't there more literature on this in the in the zoo biology journal or the veterinary journals out there. So you also heard about uh, survivorship. Um, the paper by doctors Jet and Ventry and also by Dr. Robeck. Look at the last line there. Survivorship rates in captivity are comparable to populations in the northeastern Pacific Ocean that are endangered and threatened. That's as good as it gets to SeaWorld. SeaWorld's habitat allows their whales to survive just as well as endangered and threatened populations. That's who they're comparing their whales to in that paper. They say that they live as long as they do in the wild. Yes, but those whales in the wild are endangered and threatened. So that's not actually something to shout about. Then finally in conservation, I'm going to wrap up really quickly here because I only have a minute. These are the captures in Russia. All right? As I said, 10 of those were before February 12, 2014. Five of them have been since. They are in China and Russia. Again, SeaWorld's Dr. Nolens told you 
He had no idea where these whales were. Well, I know where these whales are. Why doesn't he know where these whales are? He should know. This is something that the public display industry is doing. He should know what his brethren are doing. All right. The fact is, is that we now know that eight of them are in China. I am going to be in Beijing later this year to do a press conference to announce a campaign to address the welfare of those whales. It is not a good thing that they're going to China, but that's where they are, and I happen to know that, so I'm just confused as to why SeaWorld does not. All right. If they're a conservation organization, they ought to know where these captive whales are going. And that is all I have to say, and thank you very much again for having us here.